Well, it finally happened. Last week I retired my beloved Bone Shaper at the ripe old age of level 9. It's always a little bittersweet to say goodbye to a character that you played so long and had so much fun playing. And the Bone Shaper was indeed fun. And I might add, low-key overpowered past level 8 or so. We'll get more into that later though. Anyhow, I thought the best thing to do was to give her a proper send-off. So here's my bite-sized guide to the Bone Shaper and getting the most out of this wonderful class. Let's start with the character card and go over some of the core elements of this class. Now, I promise we'll get to the summons. This is a summon class, after all. But first, I want to start on a slightly different topic, health. The Bone Shaper starts on the lowliest hit point track at 6 health to start and only gains 1 health each level. It's not the only character stuck in this particular health purgatory, but that doesn't make it any easier. Now that pathetically low health pool? That's only the starter. Apparently, the Bone Shaper is into that really dark necromantic stuff, because many of your key abilities, and especially your summoning abilities, come at the cost of health. Each of your level 1 shambling skeletons, for instance, will cost you 2 health to put out. Summon 2 of those guys and you're down to a critical level of 2 health yourself. That's rough. And like I said, it's not just summoning abilities that will cost you health. A lot of your other good abilities will do the same thing and you're going to be dealing with it your whole life as a Bone Shaper. Now the good news here is you don't really have to worry too much about elements. Yes, you can use Dark and you can use Earth, but they don't really provide a huge benefit, just like some bonus experience and stuff like that. Most of your key abilities can be done without the usage of elements. Now let's talk about summons. These aren't your Gloomhaven summons we're dealing with here. Back then, almost all the summons were loss or burn cards. So if your precious little summon went down in battle, that was it. You lost that summon, you lost that card for the whole scenario. That's not always the case in Frosthaven. In fact, three of your four starting summon cards for the Bone Shaper are non-lost summons. So if one of your piddly little shambling skeletons goes down in a blaze of glory, that card goes in your discard pile so he can be summoned again in a later round. It's a whole different ball game with the Bone Shaper, and you can summon repeatedly. Well, as long as you have the health. Okay, let's move on and talk about level 1 cards. I'm not going to go over every card in detail here, this is a bite-sized guide after all. But I do have a full guide on my channel and I'll link it here and in the description. We'll start with the 4 summons available to you at level 1. You'll notice that 3 of these 4 cards have the exact same top action. Summon a Shambling Skeleton. Each skeleton costs 2 health to summon. It has 3 health moves to and attacks to. And most importantly, when they die, they'll go back into your discard pile for later reuse. Each of these shambling skeletons has a different flavor in terms of their bottom action and their initiative, but the top actions are exactly the same. And yes, you can and should often get all three summons out on the battlefield. You just have to make sure you have the health to do it. The last summon here is a more traditional lost summon like from Gloomhaven. The Wraith has only one health, but she does have two shields and she flies, but perhaps most importantly, she attacks from range. Yes, she's only doing one damage, but she's often staying out of the fray and staying alive for a long time and pecking away at your enemies. Now before we go any further, we have to talk about summons and how they work. You don't have direct control over what your summons do by default. You're basically summoning an army of undead idiots who do what they want without regard to what you want. They move and act like monsters. They find a focus. They move towards it. They attack. They aren't particularly smart about their pathing. And they don't care that one monster one hex further away is only at one health. They do what they want. They're kind of like my teenagers, actually. They don't care what I do or say. They do what they want. The unruly nature of summons is what led me to my number one focus when playing this class. The granting of movement and attacks. You have several cards that will allow you to grant movement and or attacks to your summons, and when you grant them anything, you have absolute control over it. They will do exactly what you tell them to do. Do you need them to get in the way of a monster to save a party member? Grant it. Do you need them to focus on a boss and forget everything else? 
Grant it. Do you need them to get the heck out of Dodge and save their own skin? Grant it. You can see where I'm going with this. Here's a look at the next four cards and all of them can grant extra attacks to your summons. Now one of these is a loss and I don't think I ever actually brought it. But two of these I brought in every single scenario all the way up until the very end. Wrath of the Turned Earth grants an attack plus one, and Command the Wretched grants a movement and an attack. I use these cards whenever possible. The other bonus of doing this is that your summons often get two attacks in one round. One attack during their turn, and another attack when you grant it to them. One last note about granting attacks. As I mentioned before, I played the Big Bad Summon build and it was key to my success. But I never played the Skeleton Army build so I can't fit, say for sure if they are as effective with that build. I will say that there are cards that grant attacks to multiple summons at the same time, so maybe those will work well, I just can't really say for sure. We should also talk a little bit more about summon movement and how to get the most out of your Bone Shaper turns. This class benefits greatly from managing your initiative between early and late initiatives depending on the position of enemies and other factors. For instance, if your enemies are more than two hexes away, it might not do you all that much good to go too early. Your skeletons won't reach them. Go late and let them close in on you first. On the other hand, it can be beneficial to go early if you already have targets in range. Your skeletons and other summons can't take too many hits, so it's good to dish out damage while you can. Let's talk a little bit more about attacks. Now your Shambling Skeletons have a base attack of 2, and your Wraith has a base attack of 1. Pretty underwhelming stuff for sure. But that's where having multiple summons and granting multiple attacks some rounds really comes into play. And that doesn't take into account things like Poison, which you can dish out on a few different cards. In fact, there's one card as you level up that will allow you to dish out a lot of Poison. To help this whole situation even more, the Bone Shaper can build a very powerful attack modifier deck through perks. We'll talk about that a little bit later. The last set of four cards represents two other types of actions that you might take with your Bone Shaper that are quite important. Three of these four cards give you some kind of healing, either for your Bone Shaper or for an ally, which includes your summons. We've talked about that dark magic before that you have to use to summon these skeletons that cost you health, so you need a way to manage it and some of these cards will help you do just that. I'd also call out that Flow of the Black River is your earliest initiative at level 1, and it also allows you to grant some additional movement to one of your summons. The fourth card here is Decaying Will, and it's not like the other cards. It gives your summons immunity to retaliate for the entire scenario. This can be very, very important. You should always check what kind of monsters are in the scenario before you start to decide whether or not you need to bring this card with you. Retaliating monsters in this scenario can decimate your skeleton army. They're just too dumb not to attack, even if they have really low health. Now, let's talk a little bit about builds with the Bone Shaper. There really are only two primary paths that you can take. You either build a skeleton army, or you go for single big bad summons. Like I've mentioned in my other guide and here, I want the single big bad summon build, but you can't honestly do that until you're at least level 2. Now I had some prosperity leveling when I first started the Bone Shaper, so I was able to start it right away because I started at level 2. With the Skeleton Army build, you're obviously focusing on those Shambling Skeletons. You'll summon as many of them as you can, and as you level up, you'll get cards that will allow you to increase their abilities a little bit, give them a little more health or maybe a little more movement, things like that. Like I said, I didn't play the Skeleton Army build, so I can't say exactly how to play it or how effective it is. But it looks like fun, I kind of want to try the Bone Shaper again sometime just to see what it's like. As far as the Big Bad Summon build, you're really focusing on usually one summon at a time. For me it was a summon that you get at level 2, which has 6 health I think and does an attack of 3, so it's a little better than a skeleton and can take more hits. And what you do with the Big Bad Summon build is you just manage that one, that one summon. You want to keep them alive, you want to move them around, do lots of attacks and all that sort of stuff. Now if you don't want to be messing with really low health, you probably want to go for the Big Bad Summon build because then you're only summoning that one summon most of the time and so you're not always right on the edge of dying like you can be with the Skeleton Army build. But if you just want a swarm of skeletons on the map, go for it. That looks like fun too. Now let's go ahead and take a look at your card options for level 2. 
As I mentioned earlier in this video, it is meant to be a bite-sized bone shaper guide, so I will not go through every card that you have available to you here, but we'll look at the level two cards and then we'll look at the level eight cards. Spoiler alert, we'll get to that in a minute. Your choices for your card at level two are a great use case because they show you the two sides of the bone shaper build coin. On one side, you have bone dagger, which is most beneficial if you want to stick with the skeleton army build. The bottom action here gives you a way to summon a card from your discard pile. It also reduces the damage you would take from summoning that card by two. So any shambling skeleton that's in your discard pile, you can basically summon it for free with a bottom action. The top action of Bone Dagger also benefits from you having many summons on the board. If you have, say, four skeletons out, that makes this an attack eight. It is a lost card, but an attack eight is pretty good at level two. But then on the other side of the ledger, we have Big Bad Zombie 101 with Unearth Horror and the new summon Raging Corpse. Where the Skeleton Army build is about churning out skeletons, the Big Bad Summon build is about keeping this one big guy alive. It's easier to do since he does have 6 health. He also hits a little bit harder than the Skeleton with a base attack of 3. Still not phenomenal, but if you couple that with your really good attack modifier deck which you'll work on in your perks, you can really churn out damage with this guy. So honestly, picking your card at level 2 is basically picking your build. If you go with Bone Dagger, you're going the Skeleton Army route. If you go with Unearthed Horror, it's time for the Big Bad Summon. Now I can't talk about the Bone Shaper again without bringing up his most overpowered card. So let's bring up those level 8 card choices. Just ignore the card on the left. It might be good. I don't honestly know. I don't honestly care. All I do know is Endless Numbers, the card on the right, is a straight up monster. Sure, 7 health, 3 move, 3 attack, that doesn't sound that great. Compared to the last guy we talked about that's a level 2 card, it's only slightly better than that. One more health, right? One more move, not a big deal. But look at that text box. Basically, you can sacrifice Shambling Skeletons to this new summon by ending their move on it. You can do that either by granting movement like we talked about earlier, but you can also do it naturally. If a Shambling Skeleton can use the Bone Horde's location as a valid attack hex, it can and will end its movement right on the Bone Horde and sacrifice itself to it. Each Shambling Skeleton assimilated into the Borg Horde this way adds a token to the card, which does two different things. First, each token adds plus one to the base attack of the Bone Horde. Second, any token can be sacrificed to ignore any damage it receives. Fully loaded with the maximum 5 tokens, the Bone Horde now has a base 8 attack. Base 8 attack that can be done repeatedly, oftentimes twice in a single turn. I know there are lots of classes that have big attacks that they can pull off, but few of them can do it turn after turn after turn the way you can once you get the Bone Horde up and running. And there's really nothing better than going, here's an attack 8, I pulled a plus 2, attack 10. Here's an attack 8, I pulled my doubler, attack 16. Sweet. Let's talk about perks. If you're doing the single summon build like I did, I think your best bet is to focus on the perks that will improve your attack modifier deck. You can kind of ignore all the boutique sort of perks that are on your sheet, and just focus on getting that attack modifier deck in shape. On the other hand, if you're playing the skeleton army build, you might want to take a slightly different path. In that case, I'd focus on the two-box perk that allows you to summon a skeleton at the beginning of the scenario. This is really powerful because it lets you get a skeleton online right away that can move in the first round. After that, you probably want to get the perks that give you free heals to your bone shaper, and then focus on the other ones that will improve your attack modifier deck. All told, when you fully modify your attack modifier deck, you only have two negative cards, one minus one and your miss. That's it. Very quickly on Masteries for the Bone Shaper. One of them I consider almost impossible or very difficult, and the other was pretty easy if you're doing the Big Bad Summon build like I did. I think you can clearly see which one is which. I was never able to complete that Mastery to kill 15 summons. It was hard enough to summon 15 things, much less kill them. And killing the summons in this case does not simply mean they die or you dismiss them, they get killed by an enemy, anything like that. You actually have to actively kill them with certain abilities, certain attack modifier cards that you can draw, and other methods. Well, there you have it. That's the whole bite-sized Bone Shaper guide. I hope you found it helpful. The Bone Shaper, in my opinion, is an underrated class both in terms of fun and power. 
I'm glad I got all the way to level 9 with her, and I do wish I had sealed that platinum trophy by getting that second mastery, but I just could not pull that one off. Now I'm moving on to the Lock Drill class, which I will not spoil in any way right now, but you will see a guide about it from me in the future. Thanks for watching.